All right, great. Uh, and let me see, we got this. So um, I'm Jason Baldridge. I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Austin for about another few weeks. I've actually resigned to focus fully on my startup company, People Patterns. This is my last time kind of being in front of people representing UT Austin. Um, so I'm going to talk about work uh, that was done in my lab around geolocation, and in particular looking at text-based geolocation and also toponym resolution. And then I'm going to connect that up to questions of uh, word meaning and sentence meaning toward the end. Okay. Um, am I, I'm not advancing. Okay, there we go. All right, so you can ask yourself a question, what does barbecue mean, right? And if you ask a semanticist, a linguistic semanticist, they might say it's barbecue prime, all right? And there's a standard joke, what's the meaning of life? It's life prime. So that doesn't somehow capture the meaning of things. If you're doing model theoretic semantics, it might be fine. But we might be interested in other kinds of ways of representing meaning. So for example, a lot of people are very fond of using things like bags of words, which you can represent using word clouds, to say like, well, the meaning of barbecue is actually the collection of words that are associated with that word from a large collection of, of texts. All right, well, we might instead say, well, I like images, so let me build maybe some kind of neural network and it's going to learn representations about what barbecue looks like. Or I might say, what's the sort of time course of barbecue over the course of human history, right? It goes all the way back to sort of cave days. Or I might say, where does barbecue happen on Earth, right? So a different sort of, again, another sort of uh, model that we can check the meaning of barbecue against. Ultimately, it's what this kid is experiencing in his head as he enjoys this nice piece of barbecue. Remember, I'm from Texas, so barbecue is really important around there. That's why barbecue is the example. Okay, so somehow that's maybe what's really going on. And when we're trying to develop computational models of meaning, we don't yet know how the brain really works. And um, neural networks are not quite there yet. If you look at uh, studies about how does the rabbit brain actually just blink, it's an incredibly complex network. And so we're not there yet. Let's figure out how we people as natural language processing researchers have access to a whole bunch of data that will tell us something about how can I model the meaning of barbecue. All right. So part of my dissertation research was looking into universal grammar via something called categorical grammar. And one of the key things about categorical grammar is it has a really nice tight connection between syntax and semantics. And so you're seeing here an analysis um, uh, that has sort of these CCG categories along with some lambda term semantics. And for me, coming out of my PhD, that's what semantics was. We had syntax and we had semantic logical forms that we built up as we analyzed our syntax. Well, then I went to UT Austin. I joined in 2005 and Ray Mooney is there. He said, I don't care about these logical forms you build. I need to have some kind of representation that's produced that has some execution uh, uh, location. So I can actually execute a semantic form that you've derived from a sentence against some domain. All right. And so he was working on things like RoboCup simulation. And um, can he actually capture what uh, 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 an announcer for a RoboCup competition is talking about using um, semantics? And so he would learn against semantic forms that were built for that domain. All right, so I started thinking about that, and then I was hanging around. I'm in the linguistics department, and I bump into people who are interested in things like digital humanities. And Maria Esteva, who was at the, um, uh, the Texas Advanced Computing Center and the Texas Libraries, came to me with this collection of books that had been digitized before Google Books was, all the Google Books stuff were scanned. And so they had these hundred books about travel around the 20th century, where they're, um, they had really carefully um, scanned them, and then uh, corrected the OCR errors. So there's a really high quality set of 100 books from that era. Um, and she was like, well, what could we do with these? And I was like, well, these are about travel. And hey, I do natural language processing. I can do named identity recognition. I can, you know, we can map, map them out. And one of the sort of motivations for this was there's a project called um, Google Lit Trips, where people are actually annotating by hand um, books like Grapes of Wrath for where is where are the different things happening in the book, and then you can sort of follow the course of, of the book through using something like Google Earth. And they've, you know, they've, they've found that kids get more engaged with the books when they're able to think about the geographic space that um, the book lives in. So the idea is, hey, could we take those books from there and then actually just automate this process? Cool. So if you take these books and you just run a, a standard uh, uh, latent Dirichlet allocation topic model on it, you get these really nice topics that come out. It's pretty common from uh, running LDA to get these sorts of things. And what's really cool is because these are about travel, these sort of location-specific topics just pop right out, right? And so there's sort of a, a very clear connection between some of the texts and some of the locations because, hey, it's a book about Egypt. Hey, it's a book about the Midwest or it's about Canada. And um, these, these, we'd love to be able to learn these sorts of things and then maybe be able to predict 
again, using these sorts of ideas for a new text, where is this text about? Maybe even when there isn't, aren't any actual uh, things like Austin or Seattle um, mentioned in the text. All right. Now, it turns out that there's all this metadata hanging around now, right, with uh, Wikipedia and Facebook likes and um, reviews and things like that. So when I started in computational linguistics in the mid-90s, that wasn't there. And hey, cool, the internet came along and labeled stuff for us. It's awesome. So um, I started out wanting to be able to work with these books from the 19th century. And the problem is that passages of text written in a book in 1882 don't generally have a latitude longitude associated with them. But there are these people running around doing Twitter who happen to geolocate themselves as they're posting uh, comments and so on. So people in my field started playing around with the idea of, hey, given what a person is saying, can we predict where they are? All right, so it turns out this person um, is somewhere near Seattle. Okay. Um, also, Wikipedia, again, people have been annotating very nicely. They have uh, the latitude and longitude of the University of Texas at Austin listed right there. So again, that's text associated with um, a latitude, longitude, and we can learn from that. We can also do things like pulling out uh, a word distribution. So anybody want to guess what word this is representing um, on the Earth based on Wikipedia? Hmm? <laughs> mountain, yeah, it's mountain. So, and it, what's kind of cool is just the sort of histogram of the probability of mountain over Wikipedia actually almost mirrors a lot of the actual natural topography of the United States. Notice, of course, there are actually mountains in Mexico that aren't being represented because this is English only. All right. Now, given a person's Twitter feed, um, this is Flip Cromer, another guy in Austin, um, could I actually predict where this person is? So how would that work? Well, what we can do is take this approach of parceling the Earth out into um, a large collection of, of cells in a big grid, and then we can build language models for each one of those cells, all right? So just basically think about it. I have a whole bunch of documents that fall within a bounding box around Seattle, and those are all the people who've been tweeting within that bounding box or all the, the uh, Wikipedia pages that have fallen in within that bounding box. And I can build up a Unigram language model. I could build up all sorts of different kinds of language models around that. And then I could try to characterize a future document in terms of its fit to such language models, all right? So the key idea then is um, we're going to build up this sort of very large representation, possibly tens of thousands of cells, depending on the granularity that we're looking at, um, and then we're going to be able to compare future documents against those. There's a problem, however, when we're looking at something like Twitter or Wikipedia, there's not an even distribution of documents over the whole space of the Earth, right? And so if you look at um, uh, how people are distributed on Twitter with respect to um, the United States, you get something that's very lumpy like this. Tons of people in New York City, tons of people in Los Angeles, pretty good representation in Texas, but then there's that whole swath of, like, nothingness, right? So if I just have an even grid that covers that whole area, I'm going to do a pretty poor job of characterizing some places, right? I'm going to have too many people jammed around New York City, um, uh, sort of losing their voices within that. And then I'm going to have a small number of people who are actually covering this, you know, very large area in Montana. All right. So what we did is we used a KD tree to parcel the grid um, so that it basically has an, uh, sort of an, a balanced number of documents per cell. And then we're going to build the language models around each one of those cells. Okay. So that's the kind of core idea. And then when you look and zoom into New York City, we get these really, you know, kind of fine-grained cells. Cool. All right, so then once I have built up these language models around the whole world, um, I then have a new document, uh, you know, this, uh, my friend Flip there. Um, and what we can do is we can compare his, his language use against all of the language use in all of these different cells and basically build up some kind of ranking over all of the cells in terms of how good they are as a match for his language. Right? And you can do this in a lot of different ways. You can use callback Leibler divergence against, um, between those language models. You can um, basically do a, do a naive Bayes score. You can train a logistic regression model against this. However, there is a problem with using just vanilla logistic regression against um, possibly tens of thousands of, of uh, uh, you know, output labels because it gets really hard to train that, even with something that you know, kind of rocks like Wobble Wabbit. Um, by the way, it's been fun to see logistic regression showing up here, and it's just not all like neural nets. Like, it's a wonderful technique. It works really well for lots of stuff. I don't think you have to apologize for logistic regression. So, um, cool. All right, so, so um, sexy is like good performance, not just like I use the cool, what all the cool kids are doing. All right, so anyway, we have some method by which we rank these cells, right? And then uh, uh, we can do various things, maybe just pick the best one. Um, that's what we've done for most of our work, actually. And so there's a problem, though, right? We would like to use logistic regression or something that's a more powerful learner than just naive Bayes for a lot of stuff. Language 
uh, data, text categorization tends to work a lot better with something like logistic regression because it can uh, accommodate correlations between features. Um, naive Bayes tends to ignore those. And so we want to be able to use um, that, that in here. However, it was hard to have a fine-grained grid with logistic regression even using Vopal Wabbit. So what we did is we created a hierarchical logistic regression. It's a simple idea. Um, and uh, uh, the basic idea is we have varying levels of grids, a very coarse grid to a finer grid to a very fine grid, and that's going to allow us to um, build a series of logistic regression classifiers that we can then um, uh, predict for any new document. Are you in sort of this big gross region? Are you in this sort of mid-level region? Are you at this very fine level region? And that has an advantage as well in terms of uh, query time. You can uh, basically do a beam search um, through this uh, uh, hierarchy. And that allows you to, to much more efficiently, you don't have to um, score against all the possible models. By the way, we used Vopal Wabbit for this, it worked great. Um, this is actually on the, on the real grid, you're seeing just a, a subset of it, but it's like thousands of logistic regression, individual logistic, logistic regression models. Cool. So how did it work? So for Twitter in the United States, um, the percent of documents that were located within um, 100, 100 miles was 48%. All right, so ha almost half of everybody was located within a 100-mile radius. Um, and, uh, uh, sorry, like, um, you can think about, well, is that useful or not? And I, um, there are a lot of applications that try to look at things like health trends on Twitter. Um, and so am I, are people complaining about allergies and this and this and that? So I think that kind of resolution is actually reasonable at that um, uh, for, for those kinds of applications. It's not going to be useful if you need to know that this specific person lives in this specific town or something like that. But I actually kind of like the fact that it, it has a bit of a distance remove um, on that as a, as a limitation. So. Um, when you look at the world, it gets a little bit harder. Um, you're only at 30% of people who are correctly located within 100 miles of their true location. If you look at Flickr, on the other hand, you've got images attached, uh, uh, connected with small amounts of text that describe the images. Um, that actually works even better. It's 66% of those images attached to text are um, located within 100 um, miles. Now, that's not using the image um, uh, at all. It's only using the text. And there are methods as well that will look at images and try to do geolocation on images. So um, Bruce Hayes years ago did a, something called Image to GPS, um, where he would do a K nearest neighbors on the images to try to find very similar images and then predict the location of a new image based on um, its K nearest neighbors and sort of an average of their latitudes and longitudes. And there's actually a, a paper that was posted to archive in February from um, some researchers at Google using a convolutional neural net that predicts um, locations for images, um, you know, it, it predicts this full uh, range of categories. They again parcel the world into a grid, and they predict those as the output of the neural net. Um, they trained it, I think, for two and a half months, um, and and it works reasonably well. It doesn't work as it actually is less accurate than um, the, these things that you're looking at right here. But image classification is a really hard problem, right? Um, with text, you at least often have things like mountain, and mountain is going to at least say, well, it's probably not Florida. Right? Um, whereas if you just have a random picture of a beach, there are lots of pictures, of, there are lots of places where a random picture of a beach could occur. Um, so, uh, I actually think it would be interesting um, uh, to combine with the Flickr data set to look at that image style of geolocation along with the kind of text geolocation that I'm talking about and bring them together. Um, that would be a fun thing to do. All right. So, um, just to sort of make the point that logistic regression was kind of the, the right choice here, if you compare naive Bayes, um, where you're scoring based on a um, naive Bayes uh, language model, versus using this hierarchical logistic regression technique for a range of different data sets, the logistic regression technique um, dominates. It's um, in some cases even 12% better. Um, and that's uh, very true for the kind of the social media data sets. Um, we also did this with, with Wikipedia, which is a much easier task to work on. If you think about it, documents like the University of Texas one that I showed you has a lot of things about Austin. It has buildings that happen to occur at the, in the University of Texas. Um, and so there's a lot more indications that, that improve on that. So you actually get up to 90% accuracy for um, the Wikipedia geolocation task. All right. Cool. The other thing is, hey, logistic regression allows you to like, look at the feature weights, and you get really nice feature um, weights coming out of these. And so you even get sometimes local foods that, that are associated with um, a place like Seattle or Tulsa and, and so on. All right, so um, you have kind of interpretable features that are, are um, uh, happily coming out of these models. Okay, so hey, cool, now we can do this thing. We can take um, something like John, Beadle, uh, John Beadle's Western Wilds, and we can predict 
geolocations for paragraphs in the text, and we can map them out. Cool. One of the things that um, I, would, I would love to have um, uh, kind of happening next, there was a, a neat part of that Google paper that I was mentioning where it's hard to, to geolocate any individual image, but if you use an LSTM to sort of chain together the predictions, um, it's able to smooth over the fact that you've got a picture of a cat that you don't really know where that is, but hey, there's the Eiffel Tower. Um, so you can now say, well, that cat was probably near the Eiffel Tower. Um, so with the kind of task here of, of, of the geolocation for the paragraphs of a book like Western Wilds, you can imagine that that has a natural sort of tendency to stick in the same location as well, even when you're, you're in a phase where you're talking about Santa Fe, blah, 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 and then the next paragraph only mentions mountains, right? And you're like, well, I would be very unsure about it, but if I know that the previous one was Santa Fe, I could do a better job of predicting that. So we might see less jumpiness than what you're seeing with this particular output. Okay, so there's a flip problem, which is um, this toponym resolution, right? This is one of the kind of, uh, it's, it's a subset of the task of named entity resolution, where I might say like, hey, that's John Smith. Which John Smith is it? Like, show me his Wikipedia page, right? Um, that's Portland. Which Portland are we talking about? So this is a general thing, but we approach the toponym resolution problem specifically um, because there's a whole bunch of knowledge sources that we can apply to this. And so if we think about something like Portland, for example, there are at least 18 por different Portlands in the United States. I believe there are 54 Springfields. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of ambiguity for some of these toponyms. Um, you guys probably would naturally think of Oregon, but my mom grew up in Portland, Michigan, so that's the one that naturally comes to me. All right, so how do we resolve this task? So we're going away from something where we're trying to predict a latitude and longitude for, say, some chunk of text into, hey, this is Portland, which one was it, okay? So we generally do this in context. We usually have documents where we've got maybe something like Portland being mention, mentioned, and then, oh, hey, look, there's Ann Arbor, there's White Pigeon, um, Detroit and Lansing, and so on. And so kind of the early days of toponym resolution, one of the common things people would do is they'd say, well, I've got this text, and I'm going to do something called spatial minimality. All right? And the sort of starting point for that is you detect that there are the toponyms in the text, and usually you do that with some named entity recognition. You know, you want to know that that was London the city, not London the author. Um, and so you tie that in with something like GeoNames, which is a large database of locations, um, and alternative names, and you know what the latitude and longitude are with them, populations, things like that. You then extract all those um, toponyms. You look at the possible ambiguity around these. So for example, Portland has uh, over 17 entries in GeoNames. Uh, Lyons has over 15. But hey, look, I can draw a bounding box around all these locations in Michigan. So if there's some way that I can capture that, um, I can probably geolocate all of the mentions in that particular passage really well. Now, it assumes that nearby locations are being mentioned in the text, right? Um, but in fact, you might have text where it's like Paris and London and New York, where you have very sort of disparate um, sort of things. So it's, it's kind of bad as a rule that's going to be applied to every single text. You want a little bit more flexibility in there. So um, it also, and it fails exactly for situations like this. I actually pulled this off of citydata.com, where they incorrectly marked West and Portland as cities in Texas because it said, well, Austin is usually going to be the city in Texas and Portland's very ambiguous, and then they did some kind of spatial minimality on it. But there are all these like indicators of words in that text that might indicate, hey, you know what, that's probably not Portland, Texas. It's probably that hipster town um, in Oregon. So um, there's things like music and um, progressive attitude. It's probably not Texas. So, all right. Um, <laughs> So there you go. So, so we want to be able to detect, detect these kinds of features. All right. And one of the things that I like to do is how can we get labels indirectly, right? So, um, so often, you know, you have somebody who's like, hey, look, I've got this nice label data set. I built all these labels for you. Here are the documents or here are the pictures or whatever. And then, you know, person goes, okay, I'm going to go off and build my neural net. Awesome. Often, we don't have that, right? And this is very true for me um, at, at my startup at People Pattern. We are all the time creating data, and that's the bigger problem than choosing which machine learning method we're gonna go after. All right, so with this problem, think about it. Um, I've got Portland, for example, and I've got 17, 18 different possible Portlands. There isn't a labeled data set that says, well, in this text, this was Portland um, that is in Oregon. In this text, this was Portland that was in Michigan. All right, we don't have that. All right, and I need to build a model for every toponym, right? I've got Springfield, I need a model for that. Portland, I need a model for that, okay? So I want to be able to build up these models, and hey, guess what, Wikipedia, again, to the rescue, we've got all these geolocated documents. 
um, where I've got Portland Youth Heart Philharmonic or Widgery Wharf. Those have latitude and longitude associated with them. So I can go ahead and look those toponym, res uh, those toponym mentions up in uh, uh, the GeoNames database, right, or some, whatever gazetteer you'd like to use. And I can say, well, how far apart was that latitude and longitude given in the Wikipedia page to every Portland that's in the GeoNames database? And I can pick the one that's closest within some threshold, and boom, I've got a labeled um, uh, example. All right, so now that I've got that, I know that this Widgery Wharf is a pretty good um, uh, uh, sort of label for Portland mentioned in that text down there, and I know the other one is a pretty good um, label for uh, Portland, Oregon mentioned in the text up there. Um, so once you do that, now we have general text classification, you know, good old logistic regression applied to here's my um, context words, here's um, my set of output categories, and I'm going to build a model per toponym, right? And we'd love to be able to have a situation where uh, features like, hey, music increases the probability that we're talking about Oregon, um, wharf indicates the, uh, that we're probably talking about um, Maine, um, Portland. Okay. So that is sort of a classification-based approach. That's what I did with um, a student um, about three, four years ago, Mike Spiriosu. Um, and then I had another student who joined me who worked more with geospatial statistics and things like that. And he's like, well, you know what? You know, these, these word uh, uh, unigram probability distributions that you derive from Wikipedia and put in all these cells, we can use that to derive spatial statistics for all of the different words. So um, basically just using this thing called the GI statistic, um, you have this little kernel that says, you know, all of the probabilities of, that, of a given word in the cells nearby contribute to the statistic for this particular cell, and you just do this over all the cells for every word. And then you build up word profiles like this for um, the word Washington, for example. And you can see, no surprise, that we've got a lot of density um, over uh, Seattle and a lot of densities over Washington, D.C. Okay, cool. Um, so we're going to use that then um, under the assumption we've got a word profile for every you know, word of interest, and especially the toponyms. And then we're going to use that along with um, in a document context where I want to resolve Washington. And now I've got all the words that are around it. And maybe I'm going to sort of add in um, the, uh, uh, the vectors that are coming, or the word profiles that are coming for the other toponyms in that document. And I'm also going to add in maybe even words like mountain and so on and, and that sort of thing. All right, so now if I do Washington plus Seahawks, the distribution shifts um, very heavily towards where we're standing right now. All right. The funny thing is, is, is my student used these as examples, and there was no intention of like coming here to, to Seattle for that. So it just kind of worked out fortuitously. All right, so how does this all work? So you know, you always have to compare yourself against reasonable baselines. Um, and for what it's worth, I find, like, as I wander into the industry land, people often don't think about that enough, maybe. Like, do dumb things and then make sure that your smart thing is working better than that. Okay, so we have four different toponym annotated re uh, resources. Actually, that last one is one that we just finished annotating um, about two or three months ago, and we're going to be releasing. So this T.R. Connell one uh, was something that was created by another graduate student at Edinburgh um, uh, ten, over 10 years ago. And it's basically documents that come from um, newswire text about events happening around the world. So it has a lot of this kind of New York, London, um, uh, uh, San Francisco, big cities, um, that kind of thing. And it tends to talk about cities with large populations. So if all you do is for every toponym you say pick the most populous city that is associated with that toponym, um, you're going to do pretty well. It gets like 91% accuracy. All right? That doesn't work so well for this other data set called LGL, which was specifically designed to kind of counter that. All right? So the idea was to actually get data from Paris, Texas, and various Parises all around the United States. Um, but they were very local kinds of, of documents. Um, so you'd have Paris, Texas associated with other nearby Texas towns because it was like local newspapers for that, that, that area. So now the population baseline dives for that. Again, another kind of rule is never use just one data set. Always try to use multiple data sets to see how well you're doing. All right, so leave Civil War and war, the uh, War of the Rebellion over there to the side for the time being and just look at, um, so you've got this population baseline, barely high for T.R. Connell, um, not so much for the LGL corpus. And then SPIDER is a, basically a, a soft uh, spatial minimality algorithm that we developed that um, does terribly on T.R. Connell, right? It's going to try to resolve toponyms based on what, which other um, uh, locations are nearby in the text. Um, and again, those locations have their own indeterminacy. If I have Portland and Austin and Springfield, I've got a lot of ambiguity in all those, and I'm trying to resolve, like, what's the minimum sort of distance between all the different possible Portlands, Austins, and Springfields. All right, so it doesn't work very well for T.R. Connell, but hey, LGL, just using this simple, dumb 
algorithm that no machine learning, right? It's just a set of rules, basically. Um, you're already doing better than a population baseline. So, cool. Now, if we bring in this uh, thing, Wister, this idea of training um, individual toponym uh, models for every single toponym using Wikipedia indirect supervision, um, we can actually get 89% for the T.R. Connell set, and it, it is actually worse than the spatial minimality for um, uh, uh, the LGL corpus. But hey, guess what? We can combine these things where you have essentially um, this, this Wister um, machine learned algorithm providing initial weights for the spider algorithm. Um, and hey, guess what? You combine it together and you kind of get goodness, um, especially for the LGL corpus. All right, so. It turns out, though, almost frustratingly for me, um, the student of mine who had, you know, worked more in the geospatial statistics stuff, his simple method of just averaging these word profiles <laughs> works really well. So um, he gets, uh, uh, you know, 92% um, on, on this T.R. Connell data set um, and 75% uh, for the LGL corpus. So um, it's, and, and if we add, we never got around to adding in the sort of spider plus topo cluster there, um, but that would probably be even better. So um, long story short, like just going through all of these things, we, we can build up these um, classifiers using indirect supervision or using Wikipedia supervision and then apply them actually to texts that um, are even not from the same domain as say the Wikipedia data that they were used to, to learn from. So the Civil War data set um, is one that is documents from the 1800s. This War of the Rebellion are also documents from the 1800s written about the Civil War. They are actually letters from people who are out in the field um, writing to their commanders and so on. And it actually has a lot of challenge because it includes things like the Illinois Regiment when it was in um, the South, for example. So how are we doing on time? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Well, I, I didn't realize I was, I'm, 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 I normally give this for an hour. So anyway. <laughs> I, I really cut my slides down, I'm sorry. Okay, so we got this corpus, um, uh, come and check it out. Let me just finish up very quickly by saying um, uh, there are a lot of ways of thinking about how words correlate with interesting things, um, such as geography, demographics, so like male versus female, Men and women use language differently. Um, my colleague at UT Austin, Jamie Pennebaker, has studied this for over three decades. All right, so um, men use the word the at a slightly higher rate than women do. So we can tie these to things like demographic variables. We can tie them to time, right? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner have different sorts of distributions over the day. So do um, Kanye and Bieber, right? So you're seeing like the Bieber guys going to sleep while the Kanye um, folks are just getting up. Um, <laughs> You have words like snow and beach, if we look over the course of years, they have a sort of a periodic um, distribution. It makes sense, right? But also things like cookie and diet have distributions where, you know, we kind of have cookie around Christmas and then we have diet right after that. We have over the whole course of human history, right, um, of words like war, and then you can see like the words like slave showing up for um, both the Civil War and for um, uh, the Vietnam War when civil rights was going on. So. Um, I'll just kind of go over that. We can use the same method um, that I was talking about for geolocation to do things like temporal resolution. And um, we can t consider tying in other modalities like video and image. So a lot of people these days are interested in things like word to vec and they're like, word to vec, word to People have been doing word vectors for a freaking long time, like multiple decades, right? Um, so, sorry, it's like it slightly frustrating to me that it's so exciting for people. Um, <laughs> so. It's very circular, right? You're defining words in terms of words, all right? So wouldn't it be interesting if our word representations actually went beyond being sort of circular in that way and connected in representations that come from geography or that come from different uh, granularities of time or that come in from images and so on. And then if we could piece those into logical forms, and this is something that Ray Mooney and Katrin Eric, my colleagues at UT Austin, are really interested in doing is using sort of soft inferences, using similarity on word representations along with actual logical forms. Cool, and they're using things like Markov logic networks and stuff like that to do that. So um, basically it's an appeal to think about the meaning of words and the meaning of sentences as more than just squishing them all into a vector. As Ray Mooney, um, my colleague, always says, you can't squish the meaning of a um, sentence into a vector. Turns out if you do matrices, you can maybe start getting there. But um, I'll just leave you with that. Uh, meaning is hard and interesting. So cool, thank you.